So my name is Emily Kyle. I am at the Kyle Law Firm and we are located in Scottsdale, um, just in McCormick Ranch. I've been an attorney. This is my 30th year anniversary. So for a little while, I've been practicing law. I've had my own firm for about almost 20 of those years. And we practice in the areas of special needs planning, guardianships and conservatorships, probate, trust administration, and estate planning. And um, I just wanted to have a career where I felt like I was being helpful to people um, and trying to not fight with people. So it's mm -hmm. been great and I love my team. And so thank all of you for um, joining us today. And so we can learn a little bit about different learning styles, which I think we all have for sure. And I'm just thrilled to have um, Katie and Megan here from New Way Academy. I've had the privilege of um, being kind of having some relationship with the school for many, many years. Um, originally, I went and just took a tour because I was trying to learn more about schools that were there for kids who learn in a different way. And then I've had the honor of doing some education programs on guardianship and transition planning and being involved in the transition fair, which I have to say that at least from my experience, the kids that go to New Way are the most polite, respectful young adults that we have met. So even if we have a big bowl of something that we're giving away for people coming to the table, they always ask if it's okay to take one. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's an honor to be a part of uh, a little tiny part of, of New Way Academy. So thank you very much for that. So I'd like to first introduce Katie Chavez, who is the head of school. Um, she moved to Arizona from Massachusetts to participate in the Teach uh, for America program following her graduation from the honors program at Framingham State University with a BA in history and a minor in secondary education. Katie graduated from ASU with a master's of education degree in special education while beginning her teaching career. She taught sixth through eighth grade math, reading, writing resource classes, while also serving as the case manager for her students in special education. She continued in this role for three years in the Isaac School District before moving into the role of academic data coach and later the school's math interventionist, working with students in grades K through eight. Katie then transitioned to New Way after hearing amazing things about the school from local community members. And during her time at New Way, she has developed and grown the high school math program, created two of the high school's electives, both public speaking and criminal justice, and led the school's math department. She's also taken on the role of MAP coordinator in which she educates students, staff, and parents about the purpose and value of MAP assessments. Before moving into the head role in 2000, head of school role in 2023, she was head of upper school. In this previous role, she initiated and grew the scholars program in the high school and became a certified school trainer for Kagan Cooperative Learning. She led professional development for staff on a weekly basis as instructional coaching across junior high and high school. And when she's not at New Way Academy, she can be found with her family, her husband, Manny, and two sons, Caden, almost 11, and Lorenzo, who's only one, which I give you kudos for starting <laughs> all over again, 11 years after you had some calm in your life. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then um, Megan, uh, Megan Worcester has always felt a strong pull towards helping others, and she's the head of high school. She graduated from the University of Iowa in 2008 with a degree in psychology. After becoming a special education paraeducator in Iowa, she realized that she loved teaching and went back to school and obtained a degree in education from Upper Iowa University with endorsements in language arts and reading. Mrs. Worcester then moved to Arizona in 2011 and began working as a high school English teacher at New Way Academy. While working as an English teacher, she became a certified step up to writing teacher and trainer and the head of the English department. She then worked as the Director of Transition from 2019 to 2023. And in that role, she rebranded and restructured the existing program, developed meaningful connections with post-secondary institutions and disability support services, plus created the curriculum for New Ways high school seminar classes. And as I said, she's currently the head of high school. And when she's not at work, she um, can be found spending time with her husband and two young children 
looking on Netflix and trying to find the latest um, show to binge, and of course, cheering on the Hawkeyes. So thank you, ladies, so much for joining. I can't wait to hear your presentation, and I will let you take it away. Thank awesome. You so thank you. Thank you, Emily. It really um, is an honor to be asked to do this, and we value our relationship with you just as much. So thank you very much. So we will go ahead and get started here. Katie is going to go ahead and start us off. Thank you, Meg. And thank you, Emily. I would echo what Meg had said. We're so grateful to be here. I think we are both passionate about what we do at New Way, but at the end of the day, our bigger passion is making sure that students across our state are getting what they need, both in the classroom and at home. And we know that especially um, for parents who might say, you know, school was something that wasn't super challenging for me. And so it's really hard as a parent when your student is struggling and you don't quite know what to do. So today we're going to talk about, that's why it's titled, How Can I Help? We want to make sure that we um, help you leave today understanding what those different learning styles could be, different ways that students might struggle with their learning what that looks like in the classroom when those needs are being met, and then how can we help support those learners at home? Because we know obviously your control as parents and guardians is outside of school a lot of the time and at home. How can you uh, make sure that you're creating the most supportive environment for them um, outside of school? Thanks, Meg. You're in charge of the clicking. No pressure. Um, as Emily did such a great job introducing us, we just wanted to kind of make sure that our areas of expertise and our experience were clear. I find myself um, when I'm attending a session that I initially walk in kind of skeptical. I want to know that the person that's speaking to me knows what they're talking about. And so we wanted to make sure that we named that again, we are passionate about special education. My experience lies mostly in secondary, um, junior high, high school ages. I love older students working with them, especially once they can kind of understand understand and give and take with that humor a little bit that um, always brings a lot of joy. And I have been at New Way for 11 years. Meg beat me by one year. She got here one year before I did. So we've both been here a long time um, and are happy to uh, answer any questions you have in any of the areas you see on the screen here. Um, at the end of the session, there'll be a chance for that as well. And then I mentioned this a little bit, but I want to make sure, again, part of my teacher brain, that we name exactly what you can expect today. So you're going to be able to describe the characteristics of learners who struggle with, we're going to talk about three big areas. So attention needs being the first one, and then executive functioning skills, and finally processing information. So if you're not quite sure what we mean by those, hang tight, you'll know by the end. We again are going to talk about if you're attending, if your student qualifies with a diagnosis and you're in an IEP meeting and you're not quite sure what to ask or how to gauge whether your student is getting what they need, we're going to offer you some tips and ideas um, to kind of what are those best practices in the classroom. And then again, what can you do at home? I say three different strategies. That is because we're going to talk about a lot more than three. And if you're anything like me, you attend a session on any topic. You leave and you're like, I'm going to change my whole life. I'm going to implement 22 different things tomorrow. And then that can feel unsustainable sustainable really quickly. So I would encourage you to think through as we're talking about what all these strategies are, what are maybe one is great, two, at the max, I would say three, that you're going to try to implement right away. Because again, if we try to do it all right away, you will be stressed out, your student will be stressed out, none of that is good. So we want to make sure it feels attainable. And as Emily said, she's recording the session, so you can always watch it again when you're ready to add more strategies. All right, Meg. We are gonna start with talking about attention needs. And I put a lot on the slide because again, I'm a visual person. As I'm speaking, I want you to also have something that can anchor your attention besides just me. And so you can reference back to what I'm saying. A lot of times when we think of attention needs in the education world, that is reflected with a diagnosis of ADHD. However, we know that students, whether they have ADHD or not, struggle with sustaining attention at some times. So the difference would be if your student has a diagnosis of ADHD, in order for that to happen, that means that that difficulty with sustained attention is happening in multiple settings. So their teachers are seeing it at school, you're seeing it at home, it's happening maybe when they're in sports practice or when they're, doesn't matter if they're interested in something or not, it's really hard for them to sustain that attention. And it's a medical diagnosis. 
when these strategies and best practices, those apply to those students, absolutely. But I often think about my student, my 11 year old now, um, he doesn't have a diagnosed learning need. He still struggles when it's time to do homework with sustained attention. So all of these things apply to all of our kiddos, whether they have that diagnosis or not. So I don't want you to get too hung up if your student doesn't have ADHD, that doesn't mean they won't benefit from thinking through how to help them sustain that attention. So when we look at, when I say attention needs or sustaining attention, what does that mean? It means that it's hard for them to maintain their focus, especially if the thing we're asking them to focus on is not their preferred task. That's kind of our educational language for something that they like, right? So for example, if I'm asking my son, okay, we're going to sit here and finish this math worksheet before you go play your video game, right? Out of those two options, his video game would be considered his preferred task. That's what he would prefer to do, right? He would not prefer to sit and do his math homework. So when I say attention needs, I just mean when your student is struggling to focus on that thing that we need them to do, whether or not they're super excited about it or that's their preferred task. It's also hard when you have an attention need um, or an area of need in attention to resist distractions. So again, any extraneous stimuli would be the kind of educational words. You saw in parentheses up there, I put thank you internet when I said that all students kind of struggle with the sustained attention. We know based on research that the development of the internet, social media, things like YouTube shorts and 15 second TikTok videos and the ability to stream and pause and play shows when we watch them has created an epidemic amongst adults and teens and kids with being able to sustain attention for long periods. Because if you're able to toggle between you know, tasks and switch between shows. You don't have to wait through a commercial anymore, right? You just fast forward right through it or they don't even show up on Netflix. On your phone, if you're done with something, you just go to the next thing. And so because we're not persevering when tasks are difficult, we don't have to maintain attention. It's actually, we're not working that muscle in our brains when it's really hard to do it when we have to do it on our math worksheet. There's no swiping to the next tab. We have to actually finish that task. So when we think about distractions, especially if that distraction is more interesting than the task. So if you're trying to write a paper, but you also have your phone in front of you, uh, that distraction is probably more interesting than the task that you're trying to com complete. That can also look like Maybe they are really trying to give it their sustained attention, but again, they're multitasking. That's another one of my favorite ones. So they're not really paying attention to the details. They're not super organized, but they get the gist of what they're supposed to be doing. So that's another signal that we need to put in place some supports to help them with their attention in that moment. Sometimes this looks like they're not really listening when you're talking to them directly. They're not catching those details. They're thinking about their preferred task or something else, or they're looking at their phone, uh-huh, uh-huh, while you're talking to them. That means that they're not sustaining their attention at the task at hand. And then at home, I know, again, as a parent, I'm sure you can relate to some of these. This looks like, okay, I need you to take the chicken out to thaw before I get home and you come home and the chicken is not on the counter thawing, right? Or they've affirmed they heard your direction, but they're not following through on making their bed or finishing their schoolwork. They start it, but they don't, it doesn't ever get completed. And the reason we say that is an, a sign of an attention need in that moment and support is if we can't give it another cause. So that means that it's not because they didn't understand the directions and it's not that they're trying to be oppositional. So if you say to your student, okay, I need you to make your bed, brush your teeth, get dressed. And they're like, okay, got it but they don't finish those tasks and they're not doing it because they're like, ha ha, I'm not going to do that. That would be oppositional if they were intentionally not doing it. We're talking about the kids who are well-intended to start, but it doesn't quite, don't get quite done that task list. So when we say attention needs, that's what we're talking about. So what do we do to help those students first if we're talking about the classroom? Thank you, Meg. It's a lot of clicks. One area that I like to think about when we're talking about the word we might use is accommodation, which means we're not changing what's expected of the student, but we are accommodating in a couple of different areas. We're making adjustments that don't change the end product that that student is meant to complete. And any student can have an accommodation because I'm not asking you to change like the end goal or the um, expectation that the student meets that objective. These are just little tweaks that don't change the meat of what you're asking them to do. So one category that I often encourage teachers to think about is the setup of your classroom. Um, sometimes I call them Pinteresty classrooms. You've probably seen pictures of ones that are like all out themed. My classroom's a jungle, you know, and there's like stuff hanging from the ceiling and there's things just everywhere on the walls, at the tables, there's just stuff everywhere. 
Well, if you think about what I had just said about challenges with sustained attention can include being able to kind of filter out those distractions, all of that super cool stuff that's happening is probably more interesting than what you want that student to focus on, right? If you want them to look at the board, you want them to refer to a chart, you want them to read their book. If they're struggling to kind of filter out those distractions that are around them, we need to help them by minimizing the, we call it again, extraneous stimuli, all that extra stuff. So at New Way and at schools that really work to meet our students' needs with sustained attention, you'll find that the classrooms, they feel physically calmer. We encourage our teachers to minimize distractions. Only, you know, you can have pictures of your kids and your spouse and your preferred interests and all this stuff so kids can get to know you, but it needs to be in the back of the room and it needs to be within like a bordered bulletin board, right? It's not all over the place. When we think about if we're teaching about a specific skill, you definitely want an anchor chart, but maybe there's one sidewall in your classroom where all your anchor charts are and that's all that's there. We're not putting up a bunch of cute like gorillas or monkeys or whatever goes with your jungle theme because kids will want to look at that. Like look at that cute little monkey face and not what you're asking them to do, especially if what you're asking them to do is hard, right? So we don't want to add to those distractions that they find maybe more preferable. We also encourage if students struggle with sustaining attention, we, sometimes the phrase is a peer model. So we encourage our teachers to think through their seating because like we talked about, if you've given that student multiple directions, they want to complete those directions. They're not trying to be oppositional and they understand what you're asking them to do but it's hard for them to get all the way through to the end because of that struggle with attention. It's really helpful if there's a peer near them who is good at those things. Because what we want our students to do, especially as they get older, is recognize, oh shoot, I got totally off task. I started thinking about what I'm gonna have for dinner and I know I'm supposed to do something right now, but I don't remember what it is. Hey, Bob, what am I supposed to be doing right now, right? You want that peer model that can help them so that it's not always they're on an island or they're always asking the teacher. Because at a school like New Way where our classes are smaller and we build that rapport with our teachers and our students, sure, they might feel comfortable asking their teacher. But students that can, you know, go to like a larger school and there's 30 students in the class, the teacher is not always available and it's not always, they're not always going to feel comfortable asking their teacher for help, right? That's also a transferable skill that they can use in the real world, right? I can think of coworkers that if I missed an email, I would go ask them because I know they've read it and probably highlighted it and put it in their planner, what we're supposed to do over the next few days. So those are the ones I'm going to go to and ask. We want our kids to start developing who are those students that I can ask for help. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm still going to meet that objective. I might just need to go about it a different way and get a little bit extra support. And then finally, in our setup, we ask our teachers to think through, and you'll see this again when we talk about how you can support at home. What do those materials look like? Again, you're seeing today, even on these slides, they're super cute. They have stars and they have little things around them. There are ones that have, again, I don't know why I keep going to the like jungle theme, but it's true. There's like animals on them. There's stuff. The, the place for the text is actually really small. And so it's hard for someone who's struggling to filter those distractions and to sustain their attention. It is literally harder for your brain to know what it's supposed to be focusing on. So we encourage our teachers with their visuals, with their handouts, embrace the white space, keeping it a little bit more boring so that it's very obvious where the student's attention is supposed to go. So that's true whether we're talking about the board or a piece of paper. Another category that we think about with our accommodations is the instruction itself. So again, delivery of that instruction, making sure that there are visuals to support those directions. So for example, if you're telling the class, let's open up our computers and go to this website, on your board, hopefully you have the ability to project, you have your computer up and on that website. So the student can refer back to it if they forgot what they're supposed to be doing or they missed the cue, they're maybe a few seconds behind the direction. That's a way to help them make sure that they know what's expected. Or you'll see when you walk into some classrooms, they'll have a visual agenda of what's happening that day. That also helps students to focus that attention and know where they're supposed to be primarily focusing on. We also encourage teachers to break down the content into smaller chunks. And again, if you're thinking about if you attend your student's IEP meeting, you might see under accommodations, chunking instruction or directions, all students, whether they have a diagnosis or not, have a limit on how long they can maintain their attention. We do as adults as well, right? After five to seven minutes, you're starting to think about something else, even if you really want to learn the thing that's in front of you. We call it riding the crest of the wave. How can you provide the student with something to do, something to talk about? 
getting up and moving some way to create that chunk and move it out of working memory so that it's clear for the next chunk of information. So that's why chunking is so important. Um, and then we also use, you might have heard in my bio, we use Kagan Cooperative Learning, which is a structured opportunity for students to interact and again, kind of chew on that material that they learned. Whether it's Kagan Cooperative Learning or another kind of curriculum or strategy, we always encourage our teachers um, that we meet with from other schools to learn about cooperative learning because it's really impactful for our students. We also know in a classroom that pacing is really important. So that just means how quickly the teacher moves through the material. So you'll see this is something that comes up in a couple of our other sections as well, but encouraging teachers to take the time to make sure that students are really understanding before they move to that next chunk. Adjusting your pace, taking longer. We often use the phrase depth over breadth. That's so important. And then finally, output. So if I want students to demonstrate mastery of a particular skill, how can I do that in a way that's going to meet that learner's needs? It doesn't always have to be a unit test. It doesn't always have to be a packet or an online assessment, because for some of our students, the ones that I mentioned that struggle with sustaining attention, that's really hard for them to persevere through that whole task. So could I make it shorter? Could I make it a project? Could I have them tell me the answers verbally and we're having a conversation or an interview rather than them filling it out on paper? Would that still get me what I wanted, which is a gauge of their understanding? Most of the time, yes, depending on the content. And so that's another accommodation that, again, you can ask for or talk about if you're in an IEP meeting, but also just we encourage teachers in general. They work for all kids. Accommodations are beneficial for everyone. And then finally, this is one that um, I found challenging with teachers that are used to doing it kind of a certain way. But students that have issues with sustained attention can sometimes be interpreted as oppositional. And like we talked about, that doesn't, that's not the same thing. Having a hard time being able to pay attention and maintain that attention throughout is a task to completion is not the same thing as not wanting to do it. So we really focus on at New Way and a lot of teachers in the field focus on that positive piece. So you saw that um, at the bottom, that little logo, PBIS Rewards. So PBIS is a school of thought. Um, positive behavior interventions and support. And it's the idea that best practice in education is to focus on the behavior that you want to see rather than naming and consequencing the behavior that you don't want to see. So if I said to the class, okay, everyone take out your pencil and eight kids have done it and a couple of the kids have not yet, I'm instead of saying, Johnny, get out your pencil, right? And calling him out in front of the whole class. I'm saying, wow, Emily, thank you so much for getting out your pencil. That's a point. Oh my gosh, Trevor, great job getting your pencil out so quickly. And then Johnny's like, oh yeah, my pencil, right? So I get the same result. The, the students that don't have their pencils out now have them out, but I haven't had to like publicly shame anyone or damage my rapport with them. And I've incentivized those kids that are always doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're getting like that little shout out as opposed to losing my attention because I'm focused on the students that haven't yet met my expectation. So that's PBIS in a nutshell. We also um, encourage our families and our teachers to focus on how that behavior is addressed. A lot of times students with challenges with attention, they're also impulsive. A lot of times those go hand in hand. And so they're saying a bunch of things because they're uncomfortable with the fact that they're getting called out on their behavior. And so we use a strategy called ignore the noise. Like I've told you the expectation, you are continuing to talk. I'm gonna walk away and come back because I just need to see that you've done that behavior that I asked you to do. Um, and so that's again, a strategy you can even look it up, ignore the noise, ADHD. That's one that again would help at home as well. And then finally, we encourage our teachers in the moment, again, with that impulsivity or sustained attention challenge, you're going to have a hard time getting through past that immediate, almost like caveman fight or flight response. So we use that phrase when cooler heads prevail. So take some time, some distance. And this is again, if something was, you know, a real major break of classroom expectations, you follow up later that day, you follow up the next day, because by then everyone's kind of back in their critical thinking part of their brain and is actually able to really look at the situation rather than responding um, kind of out of panic or again in that fight or flight mode. So we encourage some distance from the behavior itself to the follow up. So how can you help students at home who struggle with attention? You're gonna see again, a lot of these are repeated when we talk about different areas of need, but one that's really helpful is to devote a space in your home for homework and only homework. Preferably, although not required, it's not in their room because Again, going back to minimizing distractions, their room might have cool stuff in it that's way more interesting than their math homework that I keep going back to. So it also, we want their brain to associate that space with homework time. Okay, I'm going to my desk, 
I have to do my homework. If I'm going to my room to my desk, there's a bed in there. Maybe I'm also taking a nap. There's a screen, maybe there's a basketball hoop. There's stuff that's way more interesting. And so I'm not necessarily walking into my room every single time and thinking homework. So anything we can do to kind of get our brain in that space is going to help us sustain that attention. So a homework only space is a really helpful strategy to start. Again, you've heard me say it now several times, minimizing distractions as much as possible. And not, so some students are convinced that listening to music helps them. And sometimes it does, but it often depends on the music. Um, and sometimes it doesn't. So that's something to be mindful of knowing your student. A lot of times if they have like those Beats headphones, rather than listening to music, they can actually put it on a mode that filters out white noise. That's sometimes really helpful. I think a bigger issue, which I know covers way more than just an attention need, is a device contract. Because a lot of times I say to families that when your student's working on homework, they shouldn't have access to their device. But the time to tell them that is not like this afternoon they get home and you're like, okay, I have your new homework space. We're going to get started. No phone, right? Because if they're used to that, they're going to be like, what the heck? So really thinking through how you can proactively have that conversation, set agreements, before they're in that zone. Because for some of our students, and I always go to math homework, right? That can be something that causes them a lot of anxiety. So they're already in fight or flight and now you're taking away the thing that they really want. That's not necessarily gonna go very well. So the more that you can address that proactively before they're in that space, the more helpful that's gonna be. And then you also doing some homework. How does your student's school track homework? Is your student expected to fill out a paper planner? Is there an online system? Do you know how to log into that system? Do you know how to check what's going on in that system once you're logged in? Really educating yourself so that you can support your student at home, even if they're in high school and you want them to have that individual, that independent responsibility, I totally get that and you can get there. But if they're struggling with attention, they need your help. And so helping them by getting fluent yourself in how they track their assignments at their school will help to make sure that that loop gets closed and those assignments get done. So one way to do that, if you're able to log in, for example, if it's an online system, the start of homework time, you're meeting with your student, they're pulling it up on their computer or device, if you're pulling it up on yours, you're talking through each one, and you make a checklist of what they need to do that day. Something that is like daily assignments, and then a lot of students have an ongoing assignment, right? Like maybe they have a reading log that's due at the end of the week, they have to read 20 minutes each night, add that 20 minutes to their checklist, right? We're not going to add their reading log that's due at the end of the week to the checklist. It's just one chunk. Tonight, we're going to read 20 minutes. Tonight, we're going to do the first slide of your project. So you really helping them to break that assignment down into chunks and adding it to that checklist is also going to help. Because sometimes, and Meg will talk about this a little bit in her executive functioning piece, but with sustained attention, part of the challenge is also, what does the finished product even look like? It feels so far away. And then they just give up. So being able to help them chunk it and adding that to a checklist that they can check off or that they can erase when they finish each item, it makes it really concrete for them and they can see that visual progress. Like, oh my gosh, I got this done. Oh my gosh, I got this done. I would also suggest, and again, before you do this for the first time, thinking through what breaks could look like. If your student is spending a lot of time on homework, like I said about riding the crest of the wave, if it feels like an endless you know, adventure of solitude, they're just doing homework for hours and hours, that's going to really affect their ability to do it and also probably their overall affect. And so working with that student, setting a timer, you know, you work on this for 20 minutes, you can take a break. That is a good strategy in and of itself, but you want to make sure that before you do that, you've defined with your kiddo, what does a break look like? I would not allow the phone or device back during the break because now their brain is going to be fired up, toggling through tabs, preferred tasks, yay, fun times, now back to the drudgery. That's going to be um, a really difficult transition for most of our students. So a break could look like having a snack, talking to me about your day, taking a lap around the house, you know, those things that are maybe they have a fidget they like, or maybe that, you know, what are some breaks that aren't going to be completely overstimulating and making that transition back to task more difficult, but are still going to allow them to reset before they go back. And then obviously timing your break too, because otherwise your break could be very long. And then at your IEP meeting, if that's something that applies to you, you can also, you know, request, could my student have shortened assignments or less problems? So a lot of times in math, if we're, you know, factoring trinomials at the high school level, if my student can do that in five problems, 
could that still count instead of having them having to do all 20? And a lot of times that's a really common accommodation that schools are happy to give because it doesn't change, again, the benchmark. They're still doing that thing. In this case, factoring trinomials. They just don't have to do it as many times because for them, it might take them longer to get through that. Um, and it'll feel a lot more bearable if it's less num a, a shorter um, assignment. And then finally, this one is really important. Your student, if they've struggled with homework at the pa in the past, uh, being really focused on what behavior you are wanting them to exhibit rather than perfection in the finished product. So what I mean by that is when they're working on their math homework, for example, you can still, if it's expected that you're correcting it or something like that, that's fine. But your feedback to your student is, oh my gosh, Johnny, like you worked on your homework for 20 whole minutes and earned your break. I know that that is not your favorite activity. I am so proud of you. You've earned fill in the blank with that thing that they've earned. Again, I would keep it device free, but that's just me. I know a lot of people do that, right? Like you've earned five more minutes of iPad time. That could be a, an incentive. Maybe they just want to play catch with you outside. That could be the thing that they earn from doing such a great job meeting your expectations. Again, with the behavior of persevering through and completing that homework. Because for some of our students, growth mindset is something that we really want to develop. They have a fixed mindset. I'm not good at school. I'm not good at this. And so the more that you can help them have a growth mindset about those behaviors and really reward them for doing the behavior of learning or working on their homework, the more successful they're going to be and the better they're going to feel about it. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. So I'm going to talk a little bit about executive functioning and how we can support students who have executive functioning needs in the classroom and at home as well. I think Katie mentioned this earlier. You will see a lot of repetition, um, and that's very intentional because so many of our students who have an ADHD diagnosis or just struggle with attention, oftentimes those executive functioning struggles go hand in hand. So what executive functioning is, it's a set of skills that we all kind of need to be successful at our job, at school, to be proficient kind of in daily life. And so what that looks like when our students are struggling with executive functioning can be things like having a hard time following directions, um, regulating their emotions, having a hard time getting started on a task, things like that. And what's really important to know about executive functioning is those skills are actually happening in our frontal lobe, in our prefrontal cortex, which is the very last part of your brain to be developed. And though that is actually not fully developed until people are in their early to mid 20s. And then when you have students who have ADHD or other kind of learning challenges or different diagnoses, those are likely things that they will continue to struggle with and will need to find something to kind of account for that. So we always talk about what tools can you use because organization might always be something that you struggle with, whether you're neurotypical or have some type of diagnosis in general. And so we always kind of talk with our teachers and our students about for now, we're kind of acting as our students frontal lobe by reminding them and providing some of those tools in an environment where we are helping with some of those executive functioning skills. So if we have a student, and again, all students up until their early, early to mid 20s are going to struggle with executive functioning because that part of their brain is not fully developed. So whether they have ADHD or not, whether they have autism or not, it is normal for students to struggle with all of these things. I have two kids, one of which who is neurotypical and then one of which has an ADHD diagnosis. And I can look at this list and say like, oh, my daughter who doesn't have a diagnosis struggles with these things and my son struggles with these things. So I think these are um, often just helpful overall best practice for even the general education classroom and any students at home. So what this can look like is frequently losing materials. So we have students that their water bottle is just the thing that they never know where it is, or their families have had to buy 25 new water bottles in a school year because it is just constantly missing. And so having a hard time keeping track of their materials 
um, is something that we see a lot in our classrooms. Sometimes it looks like having a messy backpack or a messy binder or a messy bedroom or an having a messy desk and then not knowing how to fix that as well, not knowing how to organize or tidy. Those are things that are often really tricky, not knowing what paper goes in what tab, not knowing how to organize their Google Drive documents properly. Um, that might be something that is lacking. A lot of times we also see our students or even our kids at home having a hard time just getting started on something. So they've been assigned an essay or a math worksheet and they just kind of sit there. And again, as to Katie's point earlier, that's not because they are avoiding getting started. It's not because they don't want to. It's maybe not even because they don't like the class. It's they're truly figuring out what is the first step? I don't know what this first step is. So oftentimes that's presented as kind of like paralysis when presented with a task. Following multi-step directions is something that's really tricky for students who are struggling with the executive functioning. Um, I know for my son specifically, our morning routine up until recently, and he just turned 11, was really, really, really hard. So it was, okay, we need to remember to brush our teeth and put our deodorant on and make our bed and feed the animals. And he would go do one thing and then he'd be back thinking that he was done. And again, it was not because he was being defiant. He was not avoiding. He just truly could not hold that many steps in his brain at one time. And that is pretty prevalent in both the home setting and the school setting as well. Um, time blindness is something that we hear a lot from our the parents of our students. And so they have no idea how long it takes to drive to school. They have no idea how long they're actually in the shower for or how much time they're spending on technology or even kind of that planning, like how, okay, I have to do this worksheet. How long is that going to take? They do not have a good concept of that. They might think they're taking a five minute shower and then when they realize they've been in the shower for 45 minutes, they're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea how long that was going to take. Um, our students who have a lot of missing assignments, often because of executive functioning struggles, sometimes it's because they did the assignment and forgot to turn it in. Sometimes it's because they weren't aware of the due date. They couldn't remember what the due date was. Um, it's, that one is for all sorts of different reasons. Sometimes they can't remember the steps it takes to submit an assignment. Sometimes it means they've lost the paper. Sometimes it means they lost the planner where they tried to track the deadline, but that materials management piece kind of comes into play as well. Um, and then in addition, we talked about having a hard time getting started on a task. Sometimes that's not the hard part for a student. Sometimes they're able to get started right away and then perhaps they don't finish or they get distracted by something. And then we never see that assignment again, or it's half done and completed. And so that follow through, that kind of making sure that you've met assignment expectations or put thought into the details that go into that is something that can be really difficult for our students that struggle with those executive functioning skills. Um, planning and prioritizing is something that can be hard as well. So, okay, I have math homework. I have to read for 20 minutes. I have to take the trash out. I have to feed the animals. Um, I don't know where to start first. So that checklist that Katie was talking about when we were talking about attention needs, those things go hand in hand as well. So figuring out, I have this assignment that's due tomorrow, but I also have my reading log and I'm supposed to read 20 minutes and I have this long-term project. Like I have no idea where to start or what to start with first because being able to kind of rank the importance or the urgency of things um, is something that is just a skill that some of our students don't quite yet have. Um, and then the last one is that self-regulation. So being able to monitor in that moment their level of distractibility, or if they're feeling stressed about something, kind of how that is outwardly presenting, and then what we can do about that to kind of get back on track. So as adults, or most adults, they're like, gosh, okay, I'm feeling really stressed right now, but I know it would be unexpected for me to like flip out at my coworkers because I'm feeling that stress. That's actually an executive functioning need. So when you have students in the classroom that are having 
outbursts or are overly fidgety or blurt something out or just kind of get up and walk across the room to sharpen their pencil 15 times. That's because they are lacking the skills to be able to kind of regulate their emotions and their body and then do whatever the task is that they need to do. So we could talk probably for like five hours about executive functioning skills. So I, I just want to name that the, the best practices that we're talking about for school and home. This is by no means a comprehensive list. We just kind of wanted to hit on some of the points that could are easiest to kind of um, integrate right now. Or like Katie said, for you to pick one, two or three things for your classroom or for home that you could start doing right now. And Katie talked a little bit, <laughs> excuse me, about this one as well, and that is chunking directions. So that means giving students one thing at a time that they can focus on, and then after they've completed that task, then giving the next one. And that looks lots of different ways. So that could be verbally and or in writing, best practice would state that both of those at the same time, kind of like we are doing in this presentation, is what's going to be best for students because that way you're hitting students maybe that have a hard time processing auditory information and the students that have a hard time processing visual stimuli. So if you have it written and you're verbally stating it, that's going to be best practice and definitely reach more students. So um, that could look like First, you're taking out your pencil. And then when all students have their pencil, now you're, you're writing your name on your paper rather than to verbally say to students, all right, you need to get out your binder and a pencil and you're gonna write your name on your paper for students who have executive functioning challenges. And again, most students are not going to be able to keep that in their brain for that period of time and then be able to do all of those things. Um, chunking directions is also something, you know, when you have a student who is completing a project or an essay or an assignment with multiple steps, even if all of the steps are there, them being able to pick out what they do first, what they do second, what they do third is really, really difficult for a lot of students. So helping them identify, okay, this is what I do first. Now I do this, even if you're giving them everything at once that still could be challenging. So helping them kind of figure out like, oh, okay, now I know where to start. Now I know what to do next. Um, the use of visuals is super beneficial for our students, particularly in what the end product should look like. So that might look like if you are an art teacher and they are painting a picture or doing a craft, like what that all looks like when all of those individual pieces have been put together. That could look like an essay, that could look like a Google Slides presentation so that they have that visual model in their mind of what it looks like when expectations are met and they are presenting that final product. And then something else that's helpful is visuals or modeling of each step in addition to that. Um, something we like to do with our students when we are having them learn new things, whether that's learning how to submit assignments or learning how to use email or Google Drive for the first time, is taking screenshots of those individual steps for kind of where they go, how they do that, what they click on. Um, because again, the more that you can chunk, the kind of chunking and visuals can go hand in hand in that sense. So that students both have like the end product in mind and are getting that support for those multi-step instructions. Um, something that is huge for our students, and I know I say this knowing that it, we are very blessed to be able to do this in our school and that that's not always um, easy or possible in your own classroom, but providing built-in class time for executive functioning procedures and to explicitly teach these skills just as you would teach addition, just as you would teach grammar. These things are, we often say, the skills that students need to know to learn how to learn or to learn how to be students. And I think something that's super interesting is research will support that the executive functioning skills are actually a stronger predictor of success than IQ, than academic present levels, because you need all of these things to do well in those 
academic classes. So the more class time that you can utilize to teach students, how do you organize a binder? How do you understand what paper goes in what tab? How do you look at your table of contents and say, oh, this is a study guide, so it goes in this? Or how do you help them organize their assignments in their math Google Drive folder, in their English Google Drive folder? So the more class time you can de devote to those skills, then the better they're going to do in your actual academic content. Um, devoting class time to fill out their planners. So before our bell rings at the end of each class period, we actually have what we call a warning bell. And we use three minutes before students transition to classes for them to be able to fill out their planner, get all the materials together, get the water bottles in the backpack so those don't get left. And that is something we norm on as the whole school. So they've recorded their due dates. They've put what they did in their classes. Maybe they've set uh, a phone reminder or an alarm or they've put something in their Google Calendar. And so incorporating that within your class period, again, kind of taking it from the lens of you're teaching it as an explicit skill, just like you would teach any other actual academic skill is going to help your students. Um, and then long-term planning as well. So if you're assigning a project or an essay, helping students understand kind of what each day looks like for them to be able to meet that end goal. That is something that's really, really hard for most students is being able to tackle something that's long-term and make sure they're doing it well and that they're managing their time appropriately. And then something else that's super helpful is having visual schedules and agendas. So for our upper grades, what that looks like is at the beginning of class, you put kind of a bullet pointed list of what they're gonna be doing. So we'll start with bell work, and then we're gonna go into a 10 minute lecture, and then we're gonna work with our shoulder partners, and then you're gonna take an assessment at the end. Um, that looks like a full day for the lower grades. So what's there, that, that schedule being posted somewhere, because some of our students who struggle with executive functioning, they have trouble going from task to task or transitioning classes, transitioning to a new assignment, a new project that they're working on. So if we can kind of front load that so they know what to expect and how much time is being devoted to each, that's going to help with a lot of things. That's going to help with them transitioning to class. That's going to help with that, the time blindness, the time management, and just kind of knowing what to expect. So nothing is a surprise and they're they're more prepared to be able to move on from class to class or task to task. What that looks like at home. Um, this is something that Katie already mentioned as well, but finding a place in your home that's devoted to homework and studying and that being the only thing that happens there. It's also super important for that materials management piece to have what materials are needed in that space. So timers, calculators, pens and pencils, whiteboards, the computer, headphones, whatever that looks like. Because if you think about all things executive functioning wise, if they're gonna have to get up three times to go get a pencil or go get their calculator from their backpack or go get their water bottle, that's, that's not going to help the situation in terms of attention, but also that materials management piece, the time management, all of that. So if you can have one place where everything is tidy, it's organized, and it's not going to give them an opportunity to get up and become distracted and kind of cut into that work time, they're going to be, you know, again, we're acting as that student's frontal lobe. So having everything there prepared for them is teaching them the skills necessary, because the hope is, and they will generalize that as they get older. So when they are in college or in a job, they'll remember how to organize, how to have those materials in one place um, so that they're easily accessible. One of my absolute favorite at-home strategies is having photos posted at various places in your house of what finished products look like and look like when they are done correctly. So something with my son who has ADHD, when I, I quickly realized when I would tell him to go clean up the bathroom or like pick up after himself in the bathroom. And then he's like, yep, yeah, got it, done. 
And I went in there and there's like toothpaste in the sink and the towel is on the floor. And there's always that one stray sock that's on the bathroom rug that he truly thought like, got it, nailed it. I cleaned up the bathroom and I did what my mom had said. And that is not at all what was happening. And I realized it's because he doesn't understand the steps involved in tidying up the bathroom. So what we did was my daughter has one of those little Polaroid cameras. I cleaned up the bathroom and like put the toothbrushes where they needed to go. The towel was hung up. The rugs were put where they were supposed to be. The The sink was free of toothpaste. Um, and I took a picture of it and it was posted in the corner of our kitchen or our, sorry, our bathroom mirror um, for, I would say it took probably two or three months until now when I go say, please go tidy up the bathroom. He understands and he remembers where everything goes. Um, that can look really different ways. He also had a really hard time uh, making his bed. He didn't understand how the comforter was supposed to fit, like kind of where the pillows were supposed to go. So we did that with his bed, how to make a bed as well, um, and put that on his little nightstand. Um, you can do this for tasks as well. So if your child has a hard time getting ready for school in the morning or maybe remembering, okay, I need to get my backpack and my shoes and my water bottle, you can take a picture of them standing by the front door with their backpack, with their water bottle, with their shoes, with their jacket, and post it by your front door as well. Um, it, you can do that with a desk that's been organized if you want them to work on doing dishes or putting the dishwash, putting the dishes away, organizing anything. It's a super helpful um, tip that takes you kind of, you're still acting as your child's frontal lobe, but it's taking some of the legwork out of it as well because they have that visual that's gonna support them in, oh, okay, now I remember those steps. Um, something again that teachers can do in the classroom, you can do at home as well. So visual schedules and procedures at home as well. So if your student is having a hard time remembering, okay, on Monday I do the trash, on Tuesdays it's my day to do the dishes, having that visually posted somewhere, again, takes the expectation out that they're going to remember that independently. It takes some of that at home tension where it's like, gosh, I tell you every Monday that this is the day that you take out the trash. It's going to improve that rapport and that parent relationship as well, which can be really powerful in strengthening some of these executive functioning skills. Um, morning and bedtime routines are often really difficult for students who have executive functioning challenges. So if you have the step, my son has a little whiteboard in his room that has his morning routine listed there as well. Um, it can look like steps to clean a bathroom, um, we also have a monthly calendar that's visible, a monthly whiteboard calendar, so that my kids remember when their practices are, when their appointments are, when mom's work schedule is, when dad's work schedule is, because again, that's just going to help them with the idea that they'll hopefully be able to generalize these skills someday. We're explicitly teaching and modeling what that looks like. And then the last one that I was going to go over was teaching those self-regulation skills. For our younger kiddos, um, things like the game Red Light, Green Light, or Simon Says, are really helpful in teaching students to kind of control that impulse or inhibit when they want to like do something. And it, it makes it fun. It takes the, um, like they don't feel like they're home, like I'm being taught at home, like it's just a fun game. Mindfulness is really, really wonderful for students of all ages because it's teaching them the art, if you will. I feel like it's an art nowadays of like slowing down and not being focused on like the five other things that we have ahead. They're kind of being forced to slow down. So even if it's one to five minute mindful exercises daily, that's great as well. And then pre-teaching any other calming or regulation strategies for kids of all ages. So sometimes that looks like a fidget that they enjoy listening to music, exercising, journaling, breathing exercises. The key to this one is you want to pre-teach those. And I will emphasize that a lot because if you are only trying to get your kiddos to use these in the moment when they're already upset, 
they're not operating in the part of their brain that's going to be like open to learning and remembering that information, they're in fight or flight. So sometimes having a list of when I feel stressed or when I feel anxious or when I feel upset, these are the three things. And you're going over those and doing those and practicing those at a time where they are already regulated. They are calm, they are open, because then that means in the moment when they are having a hard time or they're escalated or they're in the middle of a tantrum or a meltdown, you can hand them the list or they've had enough exposure where at some point then they will start to be able to utilize those and then even generalize them in the classroom. Oh, Katie, you're muted. Yep, sorry, a classic Zoom mistake. Um, I think we underestimated how much Meg and I can talk about each of the things that we uh, wanted to talk about today. So we don't really have time for the third one. We'll have to do a part two, I guess. Um, if you're interested in the mindfulness piece, I just wanted to name that um, the Headspace app is great. The Calm app is great. And then YouTube also has some short um, like videos that you can walk through with your student when you're pre-teaching those things. Meg, will you just skip a couple slides ahead to that last one about things that they can do yeah. at home? So I think it's up oh, one more this way, one more back. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Oh, there it is. Um, because a lot of these, again, are really similar to what we've already talked about. Um, I think just to reiterate, as much as you can, you know, when you're helping at home, we don't want to set up an adversarial relationship with you and your kiddo. And so I think, you know, if they're into, into sports, you can use that analogy of a coach and a teammate that you are there to help them. I think walk alongside them as much as you can. A lot of students at New Way, when they're reading a book in class, their parents will get the same book and read it at the same time. They'll read it together as a family. They'll do the audio book, you know, kind of on their way to school in the morning. It can really be a source of bonding and connection for you and your kiddo if it's done kind of in that positive, supportive way. Um, and then also, again, one of the things that we did not yet talk about that came up a lot with processing information, which was that last category, is understanding and using assistive technology. So there are some great um, Chrome apps. They're totally free or extensions to add to Google Chrome if you use that as your internet browser that help with things like text to speech and speech to text. So Grammarly, read and write. Those are ones that we use with a lot of our students to help them, again, reach that target or that goal while still getting support for the areas where they need that extra help. Um, I just wanted to call out again at the bottom, you see it there in bold. All of these strategies have been mentioned more than one time. Um, and it doesn't matter if your student has a diagnosed need in any of those areas. Again, accommodations help all kids. So my student, my kiddo at home doesn't have a diagnosed learning need. He definitely has a checklist of his morning routine because otherwise I'm saying the same seven things over and over again. As Meg said, for anyone that's not in their mid twenties, I think with men, it's probably late twenties, early thirties. Um, they need someone to help them with their frontal lobe. And so the more that we can provide that support, the better. And um, I hope that at least some of these strategies were helpful for you today. And then finally, we did put together, if you want to take a screenshot or again, obviously this is being recorded, but some resources, understood.org is absolutely phenomenal for anyone who wants to get to know or understand their students learning a little bit more. So it's broken out by area of disability. There are simulations so you can better understand what your student is going through if they have a particular diagnosis. There's a lot of resources for parents. There's a lot of resources for educators. There is the ADD or Attitude magazine. They also have a website that's absolutely phenomenal with a lot of resources for parents and a lot of resources for educators. And then Raising Special Kids, if you haven't heard, they're a great um, just kind of a parent training institute. They will help you with any questions you have about how to navigate a school eligibility process or I'm struggling in this particular area. It's like a resource hub for other resources and parent training. So uh, there's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, and yeah, we hope that you got something useful out of today's presentation. If you have any questions, um, that's part of the reason I want to make sure we left a couple minutes. If you had any questions you wanted to throw in the chat, I think that's on the last slide, Meg, the next one. Um, we just really appreciate that you are here today, um, taking a little bit of time out of your day to learn some things. So if you have any questions before we leave, please feel free to put those in the chat. So thank you guys so much. It was a fantastic presentation, as I knew it would be. It's so interesting um, because I think so many of the techniques you're talking about are things that we also use in our everyday life, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a task at work, 
for me, it's getting through 5,000 emails that I have to chunk. And I say to myself, okay, well, I'm going to do email from this time to this time. I'm going to see how many I get through. And then as a reward, maybe I'm going to take a trip around my office. So I have an opportunity to get a little bit of a break and then move on to the next thing. So I think they're great, just overall techniques, but being mm -hmm. mindful that their techniques we might use more automatically and helping kids to realize that that's a really great strategy to get through things. So absolutely. Well said. <laughs> yes, yeah. for sure. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Emily. We really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the nice cooler weather and yes. we'll look forward to seeing you guys again soon. So thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye.